Now that we've talked a little bit about the history of metadata generally, let's talk about the history of metadata in the context of libraries specifically. And to do that, we kind of have to go all the way back to the very first libraries. Now, the library at Alexandria wasn't the first library on Earth. Um, I actually don't know what the first library ever was, but Alexandria was the first library that we have, you know, significant historical records about, even though a lot isn't known about Alexandria, but that's a topic for another course completely. The point is that library catalogs, or before they were called catalogs, they were called shelf lists, etc. The first library catalog probably goes all the way back to the first library, because Again, once you start getting a collection of a reasonable size, you know, human memory starts to be insufficient to handle access. Again, by some accounts, the library at Alexandria had half a million books in it, or scrolls anyway, right? That's a lot. No human being is likely to be able to remember half a million things and where they are and what they're about and whatnot. So you need some kind of other mechanism. And for about 2,000 years, that was the mechanism, the shelf list or an accession list or some f what we would now consider fairly crude system. Fast forward about 2,000 years and we come to the Dewey Decimal System. Um, Dewey Decimal Classification, which was first published in 1876. And the thing about Dewey Decimal is that it divided up the entire universe of human knowledge into smaller buckets. Right? These are still fairly large categories. I mean, philosophy religion, the arts, you know, these are large categories. But the point is, is that they were some smaller set of related resources within the great corpus of human knowledge, and then you could divide those categories up into subcategories and divide those subcategories up into subcategories and on all the way down. So the notion of categories and subcategories and sub-subcategories became an important feature of a classification scheme with Dewey. Shortly after the Dewey Decimal classification was invented, the Library of Congress classification was invented in 1897. It took decades for Library of Congress classification to really become well established, largely because Dewey Decimal was very well established and Library of Congress was kind of fighting an uphill battle against um, the, high, the hegemony of Dewey, if you will. Um, in fact, it's taken so long for the Library of Congress classification to establish itself that even as recently as 2004-2005, um, the Duke libraries was were converting from Dewey to LC. Um, I don't know how much you know about the recent history of Duke University, but they built a new library, the Bostock Library. Perkins has been around for a long time. The Bostock Library is new. And when they were building the Bostock Library, they were also starting on a renovation of Perkins to kind of update it and make it look as nice as Bostock was going to look. And because they were doing all of this, they had to touch all the books anyway because they were moving all the books out of one floor at a time out of Perkins so that uh, you know they could renovate the floor. So they had to touch all the books anyway. So at that time, 2005 or so, Duke finally converted from Dewey to LC. It has been using Dewey all up to that point throughout its entire history, and finally it was now going to convert over to the Library of Congress classification. And what's particularly funny is some archivist at Duke found a letter, and I wish I had saved a copy of it to show you because it was brilliant, a letter that had been written in the 20s from the 
university librarian at the time to the chair of, I don't know, the faculty council or the 1920s equivalent, uh, apparently the faculty council had recommended that the libraries at Duke change from Dewey to Library of Congress. And the university librarian wrote a letter back, and this was the letter that was found, and this letter said basically, please, please, please don't make us do that. And the reasons that the librarian gave at the time were, A, it would be very expensive, and the figure that was quoted was something absurd. It was like, you know, $250,000, which I suppose in the 1920s was a lot, but now it's like laughably small because it was a millions and millions dollar project at Duke in 2005. And the second reason was, and this is even funnier, because the Library of Congress classification scheme just hasn't been around for that long and it might be a passing phase. I mean, really? So, you know, it took a century for Duke to convert from Dewey to LC. And in fact, many libraries are still using Dewey. I mean, Dewey is a perfectly respectable classification scheme. It's just kind of going out of fashion as Library of Congress is becoming more popular. Now, again, Library of Congress, like Dewey, divides the world up into categories, and then you have subcategories and sub-subcategories and whatnot. So, the problem with that is this. And I don't know if you are familiar with the essay, um, Ontology is Overrated by Clay Shirky, and I've provided a link to it here. If you haven't read this, read it, because it's a really brilliant critique of traditional library cataloging. And the issue here, and Clay Shirky uh, makes this point explicitly, is that these kinds of classification schemes like Dewey and Library of Congress that try to divide the world up into buckets are largely theory free, right? They're entirely pragmatic, and in the case of Library of Congress, are very heavily based on the collection of the Library of Congress's collection circa the turn of the 18th to, I'm sorry, the circa the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, right? So you get a lot of material on the Balkans, which were a big you know, big issue in the news at the time, but, you know, approximately the same amount of stuff devoted to the entire continent of Africa. Right? So you get this wildly disparate representation of categories of things in the world. Right? Now, I personally am usually a big fan of pragmatism, but when you're trying to represent the entire universe, you really need to do better than, oh, by the way, this just happens to be the stuff that the Library of Congress happens to hold during this random decade span, right? That's just not a good way of creating a classification scheme. We can do better, thought the library community. And so we get, you know, a whole bunch of alternative approaches to developing classification schemes. The Colon classification, of course, is famous. It was developed by Ranganathan, who was, in and of himself, a really interesting character. Uh, first published in 1933, and the thing about the Colon classification is, to my knowledge, it was the first widely used faceted scheme. And I love the facets, right? The facets are personality, you know, matter, energy, space, time. You gotta love Ranganathan, right? And then you've got other facets like the subject matter, you got the facet of time and whatnot. So you end up with a essentially call number, like the one at the bottom of the screen, that translates into this much longer thing piece by piece. Right? Nowadays, of course, faceted classification schemes are fairly common, and you get something like the Art and Architecture Thesaurus out of the Getty, um, 
makes explicit use of facets, so you get things like styles and agents and materials and, and whatnot. So, fast forward, you know, well, we're jumping around in time. Um, approximately 1911 was when the Library of Congress more or less solidified the catalog card as we know it today. Um, but again, there have been library catalogs for as long as there have been libraries. But this format that we're familiar with, the catalog card, kind of solidified in the early part of the 20th century. And the catalog card was so influential, in fact, that early OPACs tried to replicate the look of the catalog card, where you wouldn't just get words on a on a screen, you would actually have them framed in this rectangular thing which looked like a catalog card, and even in some early OPAC systems you replicated the little hole in the bottom on a computer screen. Right? How about that? So the catalog, the library catalog like these, uh, gave rise to the mark record. The idea was a single mark record was the equivalent of a single catalog card. It was a single record for a single object in the library's collection. Only the mark record, of course, was designed for transfer between computer systems. It wasn't meant for human consumption. It was meant to be imported into a library's computer system. As I said in, I think, the last video, the MARC record was developed um, around 1970, and the MARC record gave rise to OPACs, right? Suddenly, you had the ability to create computerized catalogs because you could, A, create digital records in a structured way, and B, and perhaps more important, the Library of Congress was creating MARC records, and libraries could just buy MARC records off of the Library of Congress and not have to do their own cataloging, right? Copy cataloging, essentially, but for digital records. OPACs, of course, then gave rise to web-based online catalogs, which is, of course, so common in 2013 that, you know, we don't even think about it anymore, but that was, at the time, a real innovation. So, here's the problem, though. Once you put stuff on the web, right, not just the catalog, but once the resources that the catalog are, is pointing to is on the web, you run into the problem of long-term access for the simple reason that the web is a highly dynamic place, right, Things move, servers go offline, all kinds of things happen. So, the digital object identifier was invented, the DOI. Now, down at the bottom of the screen, uh, you see DOI and then this long string of numbers. The DOI uh, is, well, DOI stands for Digital Object Identifier. And the DOI is, and I'm quoting from the DOI handbook, an infrastructure for persistent, unique identification of objects. Persistent because unlike a URL where the contents at that URL can change and frequently do, the idea behind a DOI is the content that a DOI is pointing to will never change. Right? It's trying to solve the problem that physical libraries solved, you know, with the Dewey Decimal System, where once you have a call number, that is a unique identifier for an object on the shelf, right? That call number will always point to that object on the shelf and no other object. The DOI is an attempt to solve that same problem. It's a unique identifier, and it's persistent over time. And the way that the DOI system works is actually really bone simple. The idea of the DOI system, fundamentally, I mean, it's a little more complicated than this, but at its heart, it's this simple, right? You have an incredibly straightforward database with two columns. You have a DOI and you have a URL. 
So this DOI is the equivalent of this URL. So if a publisher changes its servers or moves or is bought up by another publisher or whatever, the URL can change and the publisher, all the publisher needs to do is update the URL that's associated with this DOI. You, the user, type a DOI into your browser, click on a DOI link, and you're directed to the DOI system. That DOI is the equivalent of this URL. Your browser gets redirected to the appropriate URL. And the URL can be updated in this database over time as the web changes, but the DOI always remains consistent, persistent. Now, this has been such a successful system, right? Library technology has been so successful that suddenly we're in an environment where these solutions that have been developed for library specific problems, more or less, are leaking out of the library sector and you get other organizations entirely that are able to harness these same tools and provide access to the same kinds of resources that the library provides access to. Now, I'm not saying provides access in the same way, I'm saying provides access to the same kinds of resources, right? So you get this perception developing on the web on, in the world that everything is on the web because libraries have done such a marvelous job, frankly, of developing technologies that allow for access, that now other organizations can adopt those tools for their own purposes. And what does this all have to do with metadata for libraries? Because the record is metadata, right? the MARC record, the DOI, all of these things are associated with objects out there on the web. Those are all metadata. So I would argue that metadata is absolutely fundamental to information and library science. I don't know that many people in this field would disagree with that statement. I would also however, argue, and this may be slightly more controversial, I would also argue that metadata is absolutely fundamental to the way the web works, right? Because you've got objects out on the web, web pages, what have you, and you've got descriptions of those things, even if those descriptions are just a link, right? This thing links to that other thing, and the link itself can, to a certain extent, be considered metadata. So I think you could make a reasonable argument that library technology, the technologies that were developed to solve the problems of organization and access for a library environment had a really significant impact on the way we use the web today.